Hello everyone, good evening and welcome. I'm Marilyn Emery, President and CEO of Women's College Hospital. I am so pleased to welcome all of you to our inaugural Jim Ruderman Lecture on Innovation and Leadership. Dr. Jim Ruderman was not only one of the most highly respected physicians and healthcare leaders in this country, he was also a much loved friend and a cherished colleague to those who had the privilege to work with him. Throughout his extraordinary career, Jim held various leadership positions within the hospital serving as both our Chief of Staff as well as our Chief of Family Medicine. Under his leadership, our family health team at Women's College Hospital was established and the Department of Family and Community Medicine was the first department at Women's College to fully implement an electronic medical record. But beyond Jim's administrative roles, his passion was caring for his patients. He was a constant advocate for their health and well-being. Jim was also a teacher. He mentored generations of physicians early in their careers who went on to become leaders and advocates within our health system. How many of you here in this room were mentored by Jim? I have to put my hand up too. <clears throat> so, during his tenure, he established the Fregon Blau Chair in Family Practice Research and was the recipient of numerous awards including the Ontario Family Physician of the Year in 2005. It is actually impossible to capture in words the indelible contributions that Jim made to our hospital, to his patients, and to the broader healthcare community, or the enduring personal impact he had on so many people. One of the things that impacted me early on in my getting to know Jim and will stay with me forever is how much Jim understood and stood for women. Whether he was mentoring academic leaders, mentoring <clears throat> young women into clinical practice, mentoring a CEO who'd been around a while but never been at Women's College Hospital, um, <clears throat> His mentoring and his standing for women and understanding women is something that had an enduring impact on me. It is for that and so many other reasons that the Jim Ruderman Lecture Series was established to honor Jim's many contributions and to continue his important work. The series of lectures in leadership and innovation is supported by WEAVE the Women's College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care. This lecture will be given annually and will be delivered by an individual selected by a committee who will speak about the important or within the important domain of leadership and innovation in the healthcare system. For this inaugural lecture, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. James Orbinski a globally recognized humanitarian and a leader in global health. I would now like to invite Dr. Lynn Wilson to say a few words and to introduce Dr. Orbinski. Dr. Wilson is chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto and a family phys physician at Women's College Hospital Family Medicine Practice. Please welcome Dr. Wilson. Hello everyone, um, I'm really honored to be here and to celebrate with all of you the life and work of our dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jim Ruderman. Many of you had a chance to, um, to visit with uh, Jim's wife, Ela, and his children. And uh, Ela, your words uh, remarking on what you've been hearing from Jim's patients in the past four months were very touching. Thank you for that. Um, as well as being the chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto, I'm a practicing family doctor at Women's College Hospital. Um, and as some of you heard a little while ago, uh, have 
was very fortunate to work with Jim in many different ways for many years and for the last three years with him as my boss and I really, really appreciated that. Um, I, because of my long-standing relationship with Jim, I can personally attest to how much he touched the hearts and minds of so many colleagues, students and patients here at Women's College, but well beyond as well. Um, and how wonderful that the inaugural speaker for uh, the Jim Ruderman Lecture Series is Dr. James Urbinski. Now, you know, you could actually create a Jim Ruderman Lecture by going through James's uh, CV, right, and his short bio. So I've, we've just got a few points there. He's looking at me like they better be really few. Um, what I do want you to know, for some of you who don't know this, is although this is no longer the case, um, James was a, um, his primary appointment at U of T uh, when he was here um, was with our Department of Family and Community Medicine. He attained full professor and we were always very proud that he was a member of the department and learned from you endlessly. Um, James is a humanitarian practitioner and advocate. He's a leading scholar in global health. Uh, currently, he is the CG Research Chair in Global Health at the Belsilly School of International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University. And he continues to um, uh, hold the rank of full professor of medicine at the Dalana School of Public Health here at U of T. Many of you know about Dr. Abinsky. Um, after extensive humanitarian field experience in war, which he's written about, famine and ep epidemics, he was elected the International Council President of Doctors Without Borders in the late 1990s, and in 1999 accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of that remarkable organization. Um, I think one of the most remarkable things that Dr. Binsky has done was to co-chair the establishment of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases initiative. I think that's been a very important initiative. This is a global research network established in the early 2000s that focuses on drug research and development for neglected tropical, tropical diseases. And um, you've released six new treatments for tropical diseases and have 17 underway. I think that's remarkable. As well, he co-founded uh, Dignitas International which is well known to many of us here at University of Toronto. Um, and Dignitas is a hybrid um, academic NGO that supports now more than 200,000 patients on full treatment for HIV in Malawi. But, and maybe more importantly, um, uh, the group is conducting research so that it can be disseminated to others. And you've done remarkable work around how do you provide top care in a remarkably under-resourced environment. Um, he's a member of the United Nations Environment Program Scientific Steering Committee um, on Disaster Preparedness and Early Warning for Extreme Weather, becoming a bigger issue by the week it feels. And he sits on several global health-related boards. His current research interests focus on health impacts of client change, intervention strategies around emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases such as HIV and Ebola, medical humanitarianism, and global health governance. Um, you know, uh, Ilo just said to me a couple of minutes ago how much Jim would have loved to have been here to hear you speak. He really, really liked thinking about um, global health and, um, and uh, I, you know, he was a big fan of yours. I know that for a fact. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming um, our inaugural speaker for the Jim Ruderman Lecture Series, Dr. James Urbinski. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Lynn, um, for a very kind and comprehensive uh, <laughs> introduction. And also thank you, Marilyn uh, Emery, for your uh, earlier comments. And I'd also like to thank um, <clears throat> Danielle Martin, who, uh, when she called me and told me about the lecture, there was no question, absolutely no question, given that Danielle had asked me, and when she described, of course, the nature of the lecture, there was no question that I would do it. It was simply a question of timing and scheduling. So I'm really, really pleased to have this opportunity. Uh, I'd also like to um, uh, thank and acknowledge uh, Ella Rutterman and her family. Uh, and I very much uh, hope that my comments tonight uh, do uh, appropriate uh, justice uh, to, uh, to Jim's memory. And it's also wonderful to see some of my, uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, Thea uh, Weisdorf, of course, um, and um, Philip uh, uh, Berger, who I haven't seen for uh, I haven't seen Philip for about two years, uh, and um, when I asked him how he was, he just sort of in his usual commodity way sort of said, Mah. "I'm still perpetually agitated." <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, that's that's Philip. 
So it very much is uh, a pleasure for me to, to, uh, to give this lecture. Here at University of Toronto, and especially at Women's College, uh, Jim Rutterman was, one, was truly one of, one of the greats. He was a highly, highly renowned physician uh, and leader, and he's remembered for mentoring uh, literally generations of physicians and for inspiring uh, uh, many to champion change across healthcare, our healthcare system. And central, I think, to this uh, and to any kind of effective clinical leadership for systemic change uh, is recognizing uh, and insisting uh, that the dignity of the patient uh, be at the center of any kind of change uh, and reform. And really the, the dignity of each person, the dignity of each and the equity uh, uh, for all uh, is a guiding maxim, I think, uh, that Jim Rutterman clearly uh, held uh, very dear. And this, of course, is not a new uh, maxim or a new concept. Uh, that <clears throat> it was, in fact, uh, Benjamin uh, Disraeli uh, who said uh, that the health of people uh, is the foundation upon which all their happiness and all their powers as a state uh, depend. He was a conservative. 19th century British uh, Prime Minister. And in that same period, and in a mere half continent away, Rudolf Velko, uh, in 1848, uh, he was, uh, who was a, a German uh, politician, a doctor, and one of the fathers of public health, uh, said that, and I quote, medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing but medicine on a grand scale. Now both Disraeli and Velko uh, implicitly recognized that health, in fact, is a social justice issue and thus a political issue. And both saw health uh, as an indicator and as an outcome of politics writ large. What were discerning insights then would be equally prescient today had they been made in relation to an emergent and equity-oriented understanding of global public health. What I'd like to attempt to do this evening uh, in honor of Jim's memory and of his uh, legacy, is really drawn some of my own experiences uh, to put this central maxim uh, in a global health context and to identify and to highlight some very specific learnings on, uh, on the why and the how of clinical leadership uh, for systemic change. Now my own work over the last 25 years has meant very practical medical humanitarian efforts uh, aimed at the relief of suffering while supporting people's right uh, to be agents in their own destiny. Now, <clears throat> I have very much long believed that our greatest wealth as human beings is the degree to which we can be more humane, more fair, and more just to each other. Equity, as a principle, is key to humanitarian work. And it assumes that all people are equal in worth and in dignity, and it approaches the pursuit of justice through fairness, and essentially argues that people in similar situations should in fact be treated similarly. Now humanitarianism requires that we care for the other, and that we uh, act both for and with each other. And yet it's not obviously always a given. In Rwanda, in 1994, I was Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, uh, head of mission uh, in Kigali, which is the uh, country's capital city. And that was a place with a very particular politics. It was the criminal politics of genocide. And it was a brutal and horrible time. It was a place of rational and state-planned evil. Over a million people, virtually all of them Tutsis uh, were butchered to death in 14 short weeks. Now, throughout the country, parents often paid to have their own children shot in open pit latrines rather than to see them murdered by being hacked to death with a machete. In the capital city, bodies literally filled the streets. And the gutters, alongside a hospital that we managed to keep open, those gutters, they literally ran red with human blood. And one night, <clears throat> after many long hours of surgery, a little girl of about nine told me how she had escaped murder at the hands of the Interahamwe killing squads. And through an interpreter, and I quote, 
the little girl told me how she cried without noise as she hid in the latrine and as she watched her parents being killed. Now, how do you have hope in the face of genocide? How do you see possibility? Well, it doesn't lie in naive utopian dreams. It lies in what we actually do. Now, Hannah Arendt was one of the greatest political theorists of the 20th century. She was a Jew who, as a young woman, had escaped the Nazi Reich in Germany to France, and then from uh, a Nazi labor camp in France to New York. As an academic in New York, Hannah Arendt dedicated her entire life trying to understand the origins of political totalitarianism and the essential nature of politics and the essential nature of agency in politics. And she did this with a view to trying to, uh, to uh, invite an antidote uh, to uh, the reemergence of to, uh, totalitarianism. And she argued after many, many years of, of uh, deep political thought and deep academic engagement, she argued that the first political act, in fact, is not to claim one's rights, nor is it to claim protection under a political constitution or under a political architecture. But that she, ar not, she argued that these are not unimportant, but primary in the political process is the first political act. And for her, the first political act is always very simply to speak. To speak to each other and to listen to each other. And in her conception of speaking, this, this meant an equal emphasis on listening and an equal emphasis on understanding and an equal emphasis on coming to a common view and to a common purpose from which institutions can then be created through which uh, conflict and, di and difference of opinion and difference of vision can be adjudicated without the use of violence. Now many have described genocide and similar human cruelties as unspeakable. But frankly, they are as unspeakable as they are undoable. As human beings, we do genocide. And doctors cannot stop this crime, however well-intentioned they may be. But we had a responsibility in Rwanda to speak out against what we knew. And we did speak. And we spoke with a very clear intent to rouse the outrage of public consciousness around the world and to demand a politics that pursues justice by putting the dignity of the victim at its center. Now, 20 years ago, when the genocide in Rwanda ended, there was no such thing, <coughs> there was no such thing as an international criminal court. In 2002, the ICC came into being, and it has since issued many arrest warrants for alleged war criminals and has several significant convictions. It has also issued an arrest warrant for Mr. Omar al-Bashir, who is the president and the current sitting head of state uh, for Sudan. And he's in he is charged with intentionally uh, directing attacks against civilians in Darfur, with pillage, with murder, with extermination, with forcible transfer of civilians, with torture, and with the use of rape as a weapon of war. Now, the creation of the ICC is a seminal, and I mean that word very precisely. It is a seminal and an imperfect human achievement. Now, for the first time in human history, those individuals who violate the laws of war can be held to account if their own governments fail to do so. Now, the ICC came into being because of the outrage of citizens like you and me who listened to what was spoken by organizations like MSF, Oxfam, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and thousands of other organ similar organizations and smaller organizations that met in churches and schools, in community clubs, and on university campuses like this University of Toronto around the world. They acted. They organized, bringing together academics, jurists, some of the best political and legal minds in the world. They focused their mind, their time, and their energy, they applied rigorous analysis and explored alternatives 
in that messy and deeply imperfect process that we call politics. All spoke, all listened, and thought carefully. They posed alternatives, they demanded a better politics, and they sought out courageous politicians who came to the point where it was impossible to ignore the voice and the choice of citizens. Against all odds, against all naysayers, and against all pessimists, as human beings, we invented the International Criminal Court. And now, even with its current imperfections that must be corrected, including the fact that China, India, Russia, and the United States have not yet signed its statutes, it is absolutely clear that no one, not even a sitting head of state, can claim to be above the law. Now in January of 2000, I was in South Africa at a Médecin Sans Frontières AIDS clinic. And I was examining a 20-year-old man. And if he were here in Toronto or virtually anywhere else uh, in the Western world, he'd be just starting his life. But there, his life was nearly over. He had AIDS, and he weighed less than 100 pounds. And patented drugs to treat AIDS were available in the Western world. But at a cost of more, more than 13,000 US dollars a year for treatment, uh, for, patented, uh, uh, for treatment using patented medications, there wasn't a hope in hell that anyone uh, in the developing world would get access to those medicines. The young man that I was examining had an AIDS-related pneumonia, and he was so weak that his mother and his grandmother had to help him up onto the examining table. And as he sat there gasping for air, he asked me some very simple questions, questions that get to the heart of inequity around the HIV AIDS pandemic. He asked me, and I quote, why do you come here with only kindness when what I need is medicine to stop this AIDS? Your kindness is good, but it will not help this AIDS. They have such medicines in your countries, why not here in South Africa for people like me? Now, as you know, AIDS is a fully treatable disease. It's as treatable as diabetes, and today, there are 20, uh, 25 million people have died of the disease worldwide, and over 33 million people live with HIV infection. Under, uh, and under current projections, at least 48 million more will be infected by uh, 2025. And almost all of those people are in the developing world. <clears throat> now, how do you have hope in the face of an epidemic like AIDS? How do you see possibility when charity, in fact, is simply not good enough? Well, at that clinic in South Africa, Médecins Sans Frontières, in a public act of civil disobedience, was about to begin treatment by publicly and illegally importing AIDS drugs into South Africa. It was in listening and in seeing the dignity of people like this young South African man that Médecins Sans Frontières began its access to essential medicines campaign. It was a challenge, that campaign was a challenge to failing politics. We acted and we were not alone. It was the same process. We brought together academics, the best scientific uh, business and political and legal scholars in the world. We focused our mind, our time, and our energy. We applied rigorous analysis and engaged debate. We experimented with options and identified alternatives. And we mobilized a coalition of citizens group, groups from around the world. Now this is what access to medicines looks like. This is what a man looks like who is dying of HIV AIDS. This is what he looks like six months later after antiretroviral treatment. This is the face of access to medicines. We publicly shamed pharmaceutical companies and governments that supported the privilege of profit over people's right to exist as human beings. We pooled our purchasing power and bought generic versions of AIDS drugs. We drove down the price of, of uh, generic versions of antiretrovirals by securing the global supply market. Uh, and by the year 2001, we had brought the market price for the treatment of AIDS down from over 13,000 uh, US dollars for patented versions of antiretrovirals to less than $200 for generic versions of exactly the same medicines. And today, the cost is less than 64 US dollars uh, per treatment per year. Uh, per patient. Uh, and uh, the companies that are selling at that price are still making a very healthy profit. 
Now against all odds and against all naysayers and against all pessimists, there are today more than 10 million people on full treatment for HIV in the developing world. And despite the most dire of uh, predictions, the pharmaceutical industry did not collapse. Now the problem that we were confronting then was not only about access to existing uh, drugs for HIV AIDS. Some 15 million people also die every year uh, from largely treatable or neglected diseases. And over a billion people suffer from neglected tropical diseases for which, there are vir for which there's virtually no research and development. The problem in the simplest of possible terms is that the needs of poor people, who by definition have very little purchasing power, do not translate into a return on investment for pharmaceutical companies. Now this is both a failure of the market and I think far more importantly, it is a failure of public policy. And again, with equity as the mold, if you will, to guide the forming of an institution, we followed the same process that I've previously outlined. I had the privilege, as Lynn uh, alluded to, of chairing uh, that MSF working group that brought together academics, uh, including philosophers, by the way, the best uh, scientific, business, and political and legal scholars in the world. Uh, and in the same way, again, they focused their mind, their time, and their energy. They engaged debate. We applied rigorous analysis. We experimented with options, and we explored alternatives. We created the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. It's a not-for-profit uh, uh, um, entity, and we brought uh, together a network of African research centers, the Medical Research Councils of India, of Malaysia, of Brazil, and South Africa, the Pasteur Institute, and of course, Médecins Sans Frontières. All are public institutions that form the board of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, and the DNDI was launched in 2003, and its first drug, a fixed-dose combination antimalarial, was released uh, in partnership with Sanofi Aventis, a private uh, um, pharmaceutical company. Uh, and then a second fixed-dose combination was released in 2008. A new treatment for African sleeping sickness was released in 2009. A new treatment for visceral leishmaniasis was released in 2011. And a children's treatment for Chagas was also uh, uh, released in 2011. The DNDI now has 17 other drugs under development, including a children's formulation of antiretrovirals for HIV. And again, how did this happen? Well, we refused to accept the unacceptable. We pursued equity, and against all naysayers, we acted to create an alternative. The campaign, the Access to Essential Medicines campaign, the DNDI, the creation of the International Criminal Court, and other initiatives like it in recent years have literally shaped the form and the function of global public health. Now in a few short weeks, I'll be back in Malawi with Dignitas International, which is an organization that Lynn also described uh, that I co-founded in 2004. Dignitas is focused on strengthening health systems for the care of people with HIV AIDS, uh, with, uh, uh, and also with TB, and also uh, who are uh, living with non-communicable uh, diseases. It's focused on, improved, uh, on improving uh, primary health care, uh, for people in the developing world. Eleven short years ago, when we started this organization from inside St. Michael's Hospital here at University of Toronto, entire villages had collapsed in the despair and the hopelessness of rampant disease. Ninety percent of hospital admissions in Zamba uh, district of Malawi were HIV positive, and people literally languished and died in the shade of trees surrounding the hospital. Now, Malawi is a country with very specific challenges. Um, like Ontario, it has a population of uh, approximately 15 million. Uh, but unlike Ontario, which has approximately 20 uh, physicians for every 10,000 people, Malawi has 0.2 physicians for every 10,000 uh, people. So basically, uh, less than uh, approximately 1% of, of uh, the physician supply that Ontario has. Malawi, in, in Ontario, uh, public expen or full uh, uh, expenditure on health care is $4,404 on average per year, and those are 2012 numbers. Um, in Malawi, it's $65. Of that $65, 60% is spent by government. In Ontario, 70% of that $4,400 is spent uh, by government or through our taxes. Now, you can imagine what 
a healthcare system looks like with that kind of uh, resource base. It is a nascent, phantom healthcare system. And you can imagine what the circumstances uh, were, and to many, uh, uh, in, in many ways still are, uh, when dealing with an HIV pandemic uh, uh, that leaves 14% of the population uh, uh, with uh, HIV. When we started, that was the case. Today, the number is now about 10.5%. And what we've seen is a reduction uh, in the prevalence of HIV, not only in Malawi, but we've seen roughly a 25% reduction in the incidence of HIV uh, in the developing world because of aggressive programs focused on health systems, focused on community-based access to care, and focused on uh, 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 an equitable approach uh, to uh, access to treatment. We took a focus on primary health care. And why primary health care? Because by working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health in Malawi and supporting people directly with HIV, with TB, and other primary health care needs, individuals and their communities can face their health needs on their own terms. Why are we working with the Ministry of Health? Well, very simply, it certainly would be easier to work independently. It certainly would be easier to set up a parallel system. But charity poses the danger of making itself indispensable by being too competent in doing a job that should be systematically embedded. That's why we work directly with, hand in glove, the Ministry of Health. Charity must not become a substitute for government responsibility. Indeed, there is no substitute for good government or for good governance. And we're working with the Malawi Ministry of Health, the University of Malawi, University of Toronto, of course, Cape Town University, Médecins Sans Frontières, and Partners in Health at Harvard, to research and to develop simplified training algorithms, uh, training and treatment algorithms, I'm sorry, for the delivery of treatment by non-medical professionals like nurses and community healthcare workers who have as little as a grade nine education. Now, as you well know, just because you're not educated does not mean you're not smart. With the right tools and training, it is possible to train medical people, uh, to, to train non-medical people to diagnose, to treat, uh, and to manage diseases like HIV, TB, and diabetes. In Malawi, we're training and mentoring more than 500 healthcare workers every year and are supporting and systematically researching how best to enable uh, women's groups, uh, groups of orphans, and groups of people living uh, with HIV. In full partnership, again, with the Ministry of Health, um, Dignitas now has started more than 237,000 people uh, through more than 150 remote village clinics on antiretrovirals in Malawi. And those people are supported on a regular monthly basis uh, uh, by Dignitas through appropriate training and mentoring programs for uh, uh, um, uh, healthcare personnel. And as of last year, uh, we're now working with Cree bands in Northern uh, Ontario, with the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, with the University of Toronto, and the Ontario <coughs> Ministry of Health, um, to develop a program focused on Aboriginal health in Northern Ontario. We're taking the learnings from uh, Malawi and applying them to uh, Northern Ontario and to Aboriginal communities who have many similar characteristics, some of which include the remoteness of their, of their living circumstances, their marginalization from formal public uh, and political systems, uh, and uh, uh, some very specific uh, uh, and uh, population uh, specific healthcare needs like diabetes, uh, uh, drug addiction, uh, uh, um, and, and so on. Dignitas has published more than 50 papers some of which is recognized by the Lancet and by people like Bill Clinton as some of the best HIV research in the world. Malawian and University of Toronto graduate students have gone on to take leadership roles in the ministries of health uh, and at the World Health Organization. Now, in Malawi, village, uh, villages uh, are back at work and people's primary concern, as it should be, is the education of their children. Now, Malawi, in the last few years, has experienced cycles of flood and drought, and with drought, food shortage, and with uh, flood, displacement of, of population. This has become a major dominant reality 
uh, for uh, the country. Elsewhere on the African continent, the 2011 drought and famine in East Africa meant that 13 million people needed food assistance. That same 2011 drought and famine left 500,000 people dead, and the drought has been directly attributed to the effects of climate change. A mere 10 years from now, crop yields in some parts of Africa are expected to drop by 50%, and water stress could affect as many as 250 million Africans. Exactly the same process is true for Central America and for Southeast Asia. Here in North America, Canada uh, and the United States, West Nile virus, never uh, before seen uh, before the year 2000, has infected more than 21,000 people and it's killed more than 800 people in the United States and Canada. Our government uh, officials, not our government itself, but our government officials uh, uh, have warned in the past that the country, our country might eventually experience yellow fever and malaria. Lyme disease has moved north up through the United States and dengue fe fever is in fact following. All of this because of climate change. Indeed, The Lancet has recognized that climate change is the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. Now we come full circle when we realize that it is climate change that drives competition for access to water and arable land in Darfur, Sudan, and that leads today to war crimes, to crimes against humanity, and to what some have described as slow motion genocide. Now, indeed, even the editorial board of the Financial Times, which is hardly a bastion of leftist or anarchist thinking, uh, even that board has dryly noted that, quote, simply letting climate change rip and tidying up the damage as it occurs is not an envi enviable strategy, and I'm continuing. In poor countries, high temperatures will mean uh, an increased risk of hardship and societal collapse, and rich countries will be forced to respond. So we're at a point now where we must recognize this reality. We are in a place where much as we might hope, we know that good planets are, even those that are a bit damaged, are hard to find. There's no escape from our biosphere. It's the only place that we live. And yet we are changing it so that it is unlivable for many, and especially those who are the poorest and already the most marginalized. And there's no escape from each other. I know that if my own children are to live free, just, and fair lives, then all children everywhere must also have the same opportunity to live free, just, and fair lives. As humans, as human beings, we very much need a new way of seeing. And from this, a new way of being. Not only are we the proverbial frog uh, in the cooking pot, but we are also turning up the heat. And while all is nature, even we humans, it's only humans that are knowingly changing the nature of nature. And if we are to succeed at all in this 21st century, we need wisdom. We need a new and genuine humility, and we need the courage to examine new thinking and new approaches uh, to our place and our roles in our ecosphere. The dignity of each and the equity of all must be a guiding maxim. This is not new, but it requires a new commitment. We need to newly commit to this way of seeing ourselves in relation to each other, to other life forms, and to our shared place in our biosphere. And this has much to do with humility. It means recognizing the other seeing the sameness of self and the difference to self and seeing and defining oneself in relation to the other. It does not mean complete erasure or subordination of the self, but a recognition that as the old African proverb goes, I am because we are. We need now to live this consciously in relation to each other, to other life forms and to our ecosphere. And we need to rediscover old forms and find new forms 
in language, in story, and in culture to express this. Let me conclude by saying something about what I've seen and learned about leadership. It means, quite simply, stepping up. And it means stepping out. And it means doing so with authenticity and a clarity of purpose. It means a willingness to engage debate. And it means a willingness to make choices in a pluralist world. There are many types of leaders driven by as many different types of ambition. All need thick skin and a surety of purpose. The best among leaders, however, are ethically driven. And for healthcare workers, this means remaining rooted in the dignity of the patient and the basic principle of equity uh, as one approaches systemic change. The best among leaders uh, are authentic. They are, will they are as willing to fail as they are to succeed. The best among leaders realize too that a genuinely effective leader actually follows the energies and capabilities of others and attempts to articulate and therefore inspire toward a common vision. Vaclav Havel described our current age as, tra as the transitional postmodern world we now inhabit, as one where everything is possible, but nothing is certain. The best among leaders also support others to be their best selves, so that their capabilities become abilities. And the best among leaders do so with a lightness of heart and a sense of humor, for this is often uh, the only self to a failing or at best uncertain situation. And the best among leaders as well know that vision and words matter, but what you do matters most. And most importantly, the best among leaders know the difference between hope and optimism. Optimism is the expectation, based on the evidence at hand, that there's a reasonable chance of a good outcome. Hope, on the other hand, is the certainty that a given action is right, that it makes sense, that it's the right thing to do, regardless of how the situation <coughs> might turn out. Now, Vaclav Havel, who I just mentioned, who was a playwright and a political dissident, and then uh, president of, the, of Czechoslovakia, he knew this distinction between hope and optimism. In a letter to his wife, and it was a letter written from solitary confinement in prison, he noted that while he was not optimistic about his and his country's then current circumstances, he was deeply hopeful because he had done the right thing and that he knew, he knew others would find their courage to themselves do the right thing, despite the less than optimistic circumstances. If we do the right thing, if we are hopeful, we can, through our actions and the effects of our actions, actually create the conditions for optimism. A few short years after Václav Havel wrote that letter to his wife, he was elected the first president of the post-communist Czechoslovakian Republic. Jim Rutterman's character and his actions, in my mind, embodied all of these characteristics. The task now of making our world more fair, more humane, and more just is now for each of us. So thank you. I don't know how much time we have. At least 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm very happy to listen to people's comments or to uh, maybe take a couple of questions if people have them, uh, hear what people's reactions are. Uh, so please open uh, to you. If there are any comments or questions, I'm sure Philip will find something to be agitated about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. <laughs> on that note, on that note, um, I have a question about leadership um, and something that I, I guess I struggle with a lot. I mean, all the characteristics of the that you just described and the various, uh, you know, remarkable uh, entities that have been created, the ICC and the, the 
It's the next generation, perhaps if not of leaders, uh, but uh, people who walk into a position that, uh, into an organization that's already in stand. Um, th that's the point at which I think things are very vulnerable, because they're probably not driven by the deep-rooted sense of idealism that the original leaders were. I don't have any specific question, but really just want to know your thoughts about leadership and sustainability of what's being created. Yeah, so I, can, I, I recognize the problem very, very clearly. Um, you know, when, if we think about an institution, creating an, uh, an institution, an organization, a business, a government, a political structure, whatever it is, we think about creating something, um, uh, the, the, moment of the, the moment of creation is different from uh, the moment of management. And now, the, the challenge is to avoid uh, a managerial culture which is not to say that you do not need management. You need very good and very competent management. But the, the, you still need uh, leadership. And you, the, the form of the leadership and the focus of the leadership is different. It's not about creating a new entity, but it's about maintaining the capacity of the form that you've created to achieve the ends that you seek. And that really is, that is the mark of an excellent leader. Uh, to, to, and this is why I said leaders follow. They actually follow. And your job is to, f is, at least this is my, just my opinion. Um, I don't proclaim to be a, any sort of expert on leadership. It's just, it's just my view. You, you, you see what a person is capable of. You see their capabilities, as I, as I said. And you, you have to support them and nurture them. Just like Jim did, as, according to Lynn. Seeing the person in their totality. And, and now, obviously, your interest as, as, as the leader of a hospital or of a, of, a, of a program is to make sure that the hospital or the family practice program in that hospital can function in the, according to the standards that you've set out. But you ha in, order to, to, in order for that to happen, you have to see the person as, as a whole. I've had some experience uh, in the past where corporate cultures have taken over um, uh, either uh, non-government organizations uh, or, or even academic environments. And it is a fundamentally different culture. Uh, a command and control culture, a top-down culture, um, is not uh, the kind of culture with the leadership qualities that I've talked about, I think, can be easily um, cultivated. But the, the challenge, the real challenge, from the moment of genesis to the moment of, of, of maintaining the capability of, of, of an organization. It requires a very particular kind of leadership. Uh, and, um, and, and that is really about helping people be their best <coughs> selves. What does it take for, a, for, for the institution and the culture of the institution uh, to allow for each of the people who work in it to be their best, to be their best selves in that environment? And that really does mean paying attention to what's outside uh, and outside of the formal environment and to enabling and supporting them through that. And those are, I mean, those are just some, some reflections. The other thing that I would say is that you know, inside major organizations of any kind, and this has been a perpetual challenge uh, with any kind of organization, is growing bureaucracy. Um, and it's, it, one has to be very careful um, that one doesn't uh, allow for the bureaucracy to, or the management system to become the dominant objective of the organization, it, to, to meet the management needs of the organization. Um, and that's not to say that uh, you don't, again, you do, it's not to say you don't need any bureaucracy, you don't need any management. Absolutely not. You do, in order, in fact, to function effectively and in order to create space where you can experiment uh, and you know, be free to try new ideas and so on. You actually need a highly competent administrative structure and a highly competent management system. But you have to constantly be cutting it back because it naturally will grow. Uh, it naturally will feed on itself, but it also will naturally grow in response to, hopefully, uh, thriving activity within, within your organization that's new and that needs to be managed um, if it is going to be, in fact, sustainable. But the one of the challenges 
one of the key challenges is to not let the bureaucracy uh, get out of hand and get out of control. And that I think is a, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm speaking to people who <coughs> very much understand what I'm talking about. So, go ahead. Well, I think it's, the, yeah, I mean, there's, the, the, that was actually, that was a real possibility. Uh, the, you know, the, I don't want to sort of over-dramatize, but just tell you the facts. The, the, um, the reality was that the, the uh, Interahamwe and the, the RGF, which were the, the, the genocidal government forces, uh, there were regular radio announcements that my two arms uh, would be, would they, to be delivered, uh, they would, the person would receive 50 US dollars per arm. Uh, so I mean this was this was very real uh, and you now so you, you you asked me about courage I think there's two if I have to break it down there's two kind of elements to allowing for or enabling courage to 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 emerge one is there's actually a deeply rational component so in 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 you know I went to Rwanda um, as head of mission for MSF because I knew the country. I had been there for a year and a half uh, during my, uh, my medical training. I'd done some early pediatric AIDS research in uh, um, 1986, 87. And um, so I knew the country, it was a very small country. I'd been there uh, uh, for about a year and a half. I knew it very well, uh, uh, physically, geographically. I also knew something of the culture. Now, Rwandan culture is, is, a, is a very, very, it's not an easily penetra penetrable culture. Um, and, and uh, but I knew something of it, and I knew I had a, a familiarity with it and an ease with it. And I could speak. I'm not going to tell you I'm fluent in Kinyarwanda, but I could speak uh, some Kinyarwanda, which it's one of the hardest languages in the in the world to learn. Um, but so I had some familiarity. The other thing was that I, uh, the the head of the UN peacekeeping force, and not only General Dallaire, but the entire officer corps. Of the uh, uh, of UNAMIR, the UN peacekeeping force that was present, um, were all Canadian, and so that has a hugely important um, uh, meaning, practical meaning. Again, because of culture, uh, and because of of familiarity, and because of of being able to immediately feel comfortable uh, with another in a position of authority, uh, and to know that that your language, not just the, the English or French, but your cultural language. Uh, is understood, uh, and that I could represent the needs of my organization with, Gen with General Dallaire and his staff, and we could very quickly, in very, diff very difficult, there's a euphemism for you, very difficult circumstances, we could, we, could, we could understand each other. And then I could make very quick assessments as to what was possible, what wasn't possible. Um, the other was that I fundamentally, I trusted the leadership inside Médecins Sans Frontières. So I had deep relationships with people. Uh, I'd worked in Afghanistan in not genocide, but in very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, just previously, I'd worked in Somalia, I'd worked in Brazil, I'd worked in Peru, and I'd worked consistently with a small group of leaders uh, on the emergency team. And I knew them very well, and I trusted them because we had had many experiences together. Uh, and I knew that I trusted their judgment and I was putting my life very much in the hands of their good judgment, their good political judgment. Uh, and I was also trusting them to trust me in the context of, the, uh, of Kigali with my team of 25 people. Um, and so it was a chain, if you will, of trust, not, of, not structure, structure very clearly, but also trust. Uh, and it's very, very important. And trust is one of those sort of ethereal qualities. It's, it's, you know it when you feel it. It's very hard to describe it. But you know it when you feel it. And either you have it or you don't. 
and especially in a situation as critical as uh, uh, a war zone and then one where very basic principles of international humanitarian law are out the window and where the whole world uh, uh, is either ignoring or completely apprised of, of the reality of, of the circumstance, trust is absolutely central. And as well, don't forget, in that circumstance, all calm manner of manipulation, of political manipulation taking place around the event uh, of the genocide uh, at the geopolitical level. And so again, trust was fundamental to that. And the, the other, so that, that's probably one big thing. Then the other is that I think, and this is my own personal um, uh, reality, um, I just knew that if I didn't do what I knew was possible to do, because I trusted the people and the organization and, the circ and, and the, my read of the situation that I was in, if I didn't do what I knew was possible to even try, I could never look myself in the mirror uh, uh, with any kind of self-respect. Uh, and I would, I would fail as a human being in that moment. Not as a professional, not as a doctor, not as, you know, whatever, but as a human being. If I didn't do what I know I could do and what I know had to be tried, in those circumstances, and that it was possible to try, uh, that, that I, I could not have, have lived with myself. And every single person, by the way, that I've talked about, the leadership of MSF, General Dallaire, his officer corps, uh, my team uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Kigali, we all in our own way, we all had came to that same judgment. Now we didn't use the same words, different language, you know, different culture, different, you know, religions, different philosophy, whatever you, you know, whatever. But we all came to roughly that same position. And we all knew that in that chain of trust, that if any, if any one circumstance changed, the whole thing was off in terms of the efforts that we were making. Uh, and we made extraordinary efforts. And the, um, and I have to say that, that you know, um, General Dallaire, um, he, through what he did, he did what the UN failed to do. Had the United Nations acted in the similar manner to what General Dallaire attempted to do, and actually achieved in a very small scale, um, the, the situation would have been very different. Uh, and that took courage. That took enormous courage. Uh, and without him, none of the stuff that MSF did, or the Red Cross uh, did, uh, because the Red Cross, by the way, was part of that chain of, of trust. Um, none of it would have been possible. So. Sir. Uh, around the world, the question is asked on several times, why are you here? Uh, and regardless of the country, your political, your financial situation, the answer has consistently at 75 to 80% of the time been the same help each other. It's the other 20% that concern me. What would you see for leadership and innovation? What would you see for the role of that to change that dynamic in terms of the political landscape and the opportunity to make the kinds of changes that the catastrophes you've been talking about? So I think that it's a very good question. Um, and I just offer a, um, not necessarily a specific answer, but a, just a sort of an image I think in, is within which is embedded my answer. I think what we've seen, especially um, since the end of the Cold War, uh, is the rise of neoliberalism. Uh, and we've seen the, the, the hegemony of a neoliberal political and economic agenda uh, that has come to a, a moment of, of, of near critical failure in 2008 with the international financial crisis. Uh, and we're at a, what, what that system, what that system of thought and economic uh, activity uh, really does is it tries to create an economic framework within which society is embedded. And it defines, it's the frame, the economic framework that defines uh, the values of society. The challenge is to flip that around, is to embed the economy, a mar and I believe a market economy, I don't care what anybody else believes, a market economy, we need a market economy that is embedded in society. And not this way, but this way. And the, the kind of things that, we're, that, that I've alluded to, the kind of things that, that Jim 
uh, uh, very practically urged and, and, and engaged. The kind of things that many people, uh, Meb uh, is here as well, Philip has just left, but many of, many of the people in this room are actually uh, deeply engaged with. It's exactly that. It's, it's really articulating through form and through function, through very particular functionality, uh, very basic socially rooted values within which economy and other forms of, of necessary human activity can be embedded. And I think the challenge really is to flip this around. And we only do it by doing it. Uh, and we only do it by the things that we achieve very concretely and very specifically. There isn't going to be, I don't think, there's going to be any great nirvana moment, you know, where everybody's going to suddenly, oh, I understand. It doesn't work that way. It's a complex uh, uh, problem uh, that requires a phase effect uh, that will happen at multiple points um, uh, uh, in, in the world. And it is happening. I mean, uh, it, it actually is happening. I am deeply hopeful. I'm also deeply optimistic. Uh, when, I, when I see the kind of things that, that, that are emerging, um, I'm very, very hopeful. We have huge challenges. There's no question about it. There's absolutely no question about it. But we're, we, are, we have uh, not only the potential, but we have the capability and now the ability to move in the right direction. And we just have to keep going. And that, that I think, is the, is, 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 the, is the key. Go ahead. Thank you so much for sharing your framework for how you go about doing the impossible. And I love that you do it by doing it. Um, what is the doing that's there to be done to shift the shameful circumstances that our Aboriginal population lives in, in this country today? Well, I think, you know, the, the uh, it's much, uh, w the similar answer will, w would apply to, to climate change, uh, ch climate change policy, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the health care of immigrant and refugee populations, and particularly non-status uh, refugee uh, uh, populations in Canada. Um, I think it, it, you know, we can, we can, we can wait for the, again, the Holy Grail. Um, we've actually got a Holy Grail now with, with Aboriginal peoples. We've got a commission report. Uh, that is brilliant. I haven't read it all. I've read the summary, and I hope to read it over the next little while. But it's a fantastic report, at least the summary is. Um, and it really does articulate uh, a, uh, a pathway for genuine reconciliation and for genuine atonement between two communities. Uh, and for coming to at one, that's what atonement means, is comes to a place of oneness uh, and then to go forward. And so how do we get there? Well, we live in a very particular political process. It's a liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, we are free to speak, um, uh, as long as B Bill C-51 is not enacted, but we're free to speak uh, and we are free to act. Um, and uh, as individuals, uh, as citizens, as members of our own communities, uh, we can act in whatever way we, we choose, uh, and hopefully in pursuit of the good, uh, to pursue ideas that we think are important. As doctors, as healthcare professionals, as leaders of institutions, um, we also make choices. And our, uh, one of the things that I've learned is there's no such thing as an institution without people. Uh, people make up those institutions and the choices of those people and the culture of an institution uh, really defines uh, the, the living reality uh, of the, the choices of an institution. And I would like to say, and I think I, I'm, I'm not gilding the lily here, I think Women's College has been a fantastic leader uh, in, in health, uh, not only for women, uh, but for uh, now, with with uh, uh, immigrant and refugee populations, by supporting uh, this clinic and, and housing it and allowing it to engage in very careful, considered, uh, not only uh, pursuit of research and delivery of care, but very careful and considered engagement in policy and in the politics of policy. And I think that's very brave. That's courage, you know, to 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 from within an institution to allow that and to enable that to happen. Now. That requires responsibility, not just on your part as the CEO or, or on the, the, the responsibility of the executive uh, suite, but it requires responsibility on the part 
of the people who were running the clinics, Meb and, and, and Danielle and, 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 and Lynn and others, to be genuinely responsible to their mission and to the, to the, um, to the, 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 the way in which uh, they engage their action. Um, and um, it's through very specific, concrete actions that we move forward and that give these political declarations, i.e. the commission or a declaration of, of a party or even an, an enactment of law, they give these things real form. And there's a kind of a, um, I don't know what the word is that I'm trying to, uh, there's a kind of an iterative dialectic relationship between these. They're not separate, right? The, the expression of the idea, the expression of the form, the acknowledgement in law and policy, and, these are not they're, they're, they're not, there's not a, a simple linear relationship. It's a much more complex, iterative, causal, uh, um, uh, mutually catalytic relationship. Uh, and so by doing, again, responsibly, as individuals, as professionals, as institutions, we actually create the form uh, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the idea. Uh, and it becomes de facto legitimate. And it's the same, the same process applies internationally to, to international law. You know, you look at, you can look at what is it that, what are the core elements of international law? Well, you know, one of the things that people often forget, uh, and this is something that's particularly germane to humanitarianism, uh, is that in order for the law to be applied, it must be claimed. And so you have to, you have to assert your claim to the law as a humanitarian organization, as an individual who is suffering particular abuses, but without the claim, the law withers. It becomes uh, 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 antiquated customary law, uh, something that we did back then. So in order for law to have form, it must first and always be claimed. And in the claiming, you're shaping the, the use of that law. Uh, and it's exactly the same, I think, in principle, uh, when, you, when you think about health. Uh, as it applies to Aboriginal peoples, as it applies to refugees, uh, and so on. So, thank you. So I have the pleasure of thanking Dr. Abansky, and I can say without uh, hesitation that this is, I've been at the podium a lot of times in my life, and this is the first time that I've ever had to follow such a powerful and inspiring speaker. That was really outstanding. He's given us a lot of thought, a lot of cause for thought, and one of the things that I thought was quite remarkable was that all of your pathways and your ideas and your, your major changes started with that patient story at the bedside, and actively listening to that patient story. And that's so compelling to me because we do that every day. For you, what you did was you listened, then you got all the right players around the table, you applied scientific rigor, and you came out with, you refused to say no, you refused to stop, you refused to, you, had, you wanted to continue, you were compelled forward, you didn't listen to people who were the naysayers, you went on and you made meaningful change. And to me, that's just so powerful and so inspiring for us, and that's what we hope to do here. Other things that resonated with me were your, your innovative approach to putting non-medical personnel uh, through Dignitas. That was quite remarkable, very creative and courageous, and, and really, I'm sure it was a game changer. And it's, it's very impressive. And I think we're probably going to have to think outside the box a little bit more uh, in that kind of area. And then lastly, I think the mantra, I am because we are. How wonderful is that? And that's, I truly do believe that at Women's College we are thinking that way, but thank you for reminding us about it, and we will continue to do that, and I think every one of us here should be saying that every day. Think about we are not alone, we're all in this together. And if you think that way, we're going to do great stuff. And now, so let's do the formal final thank you.